What up? This is Rama Screen uh, for Icarus with the director, Brian. How are you doing, sir? Uh, thanks for having me. All right, good. So I saw the documentary. Um, I got a few questions for you. It's very, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's very in-depth, very extensive. Um, it starts off uh, one and it's evolves into another, sort of like a thriller somewhat, the, the, the feel that I got with it. I mean, did you initially expect it to lead you down these roads of, uh, that would reveal all these conspiracy stuff? No, I mean, uh, when I set out to make this film, I started on one journey and it ended up uh, especially uh, eventually exposing the single biggest scandal in sport history and Olympic history, but uh, I couldn't have imagined that as I set out to make the film. Now, one of the things that's fascinating to me is that you put yourself pretty much as the, the test. Um, so I know that in, in the documentary, you mentioned that you felt stronger when you had that in your system, the doping. Um, could, can you elaborate some more about what is exactly the sensation that you felt when you had that running in your system? Um, it certainly wasn't uh, noticeable in like, you know, the feeling of if you take a, you know, an amphetamine or if you've uh, smoked a joint. It's not, it's not like a noticeable feeling because pretty much everything I was taking were hormones that the body already makes. Mm. So it was just more of a, an overall very subtle uh, feeling of recovery, meaning so that when I was going out and, and training, um, the next day I would wake up and feel fresh again. But it certainly wasn't um, a, an hourly or a daily feeling uh, really any different uh, than before, but certainly my body was recovering and my muscles uh, were recovering to be able to to perform better. And it's the kind of thing that you would not recommend to anybody to experience? Um, no. I, uh, 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 you know, most of everything that I was taking is the same thing that's being sold as anti-aging. Oh, gotcha. So, um, with the exception of erythropoietin, EPO, um, most of all of these substances or hormones really mm -hmm. uh, naturally occur in the body um, except I was upping the levels of them. So, so um, you know, and pretty much all of this you can get a prescription for. So, uh, you know, I, the difference is, is that in professional sports, these are banned substances and called doping because it's against the rules. Um, but outside of professional sport, these are the same things that are being sold as anti-aging and the fountain of youth. So I think that there is a, a misnomer in society as to the harmful effects of these substances. But the one thing is very clear is that in professional sports, these substances are banned and against the rules. So if you're taking them, you're breaking the rules. But in terms of the danger, um, I personally didn't uh, experience any side effects that were negative. Now, here's probably the question that my fans would have in their minds when they uh, watch Icarus, which arrives this weekend, as I understand it. Yeah, so, Friday, August 4th on Netflix there you go. and in theaters. Excellent, excellent. Um, the big question is, in your honest opinion, uh, theoretically speaking, do you think that Lance Armstrong could have won all those seven titles without having such thing in, or doping, without doping involvement? Well, that is a question that we're never going to have an answer to. What we do know is that every athlete that competed against him during his era of victories and even up through his comeback um, essentially were doping. So, you know, if you look at the history books, they took seven titles from him, yes. but they haven't given those titles to anyone else. Because when you look at second place, third place, fourth place, fifth place, sixth place, they were all doing the same thing as him. So I don't know if he would have won or not won had he had everybody not been taking anything. Um, but he did win in theory that he beat everyone who was doing the same thing or trying to do the same thing as he was. And the way that they got him was not through the science. You know, uh, there's an idea in society that he was caught. He wasn't caught. He, to this day, passed 500 anti-doping controls clean. Mm. He was ratted out 
under a criminal investigation by his own teammates who did the same thing that he did. So, you know, the I think the bigger question to ask is what is wrong or was wrong with the anti-doping system that you can't catch the most tested athlete on planet Earth? And if that's the case, what choices do athletes have if the system itself is not working rather than you know, looking at Armstrong as the grandfather or the mastermind of some doping scheme, when in fact everybody of his generation was doing the same thing as he did. Um, where my problem comes with Armstrong is how he dealt with it, and that he destroyed other people's lives in defending his own reputation. And that was totally unacceptable. And to me, that was also the metaphor of why I named the film Icarus. Mm -hmm. Because the Greek myth is essentially that you can fly as long as you don't get too close to the sun. And if you get too close to the sun, your wings are going to burn and plummet to the ground. Well, that certainly is the story of Armstrong. I mean, had he not went against so many people, had he not been so defiant, had he had grace and had he had humility, he probably never would be in the situation that he is now. And he very likely would have gotten away with it. And I think the same thing can be said with what is uncovered in the film in regards to Russia and this spectacular scandal, is that they kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing until they eventually got caught. And in this case, it was Gregory Rachenkov who came forward and blew the whistle. But had they, you know, held it back a little bit and not went as far as they did, you know, they might have gotten away with it. So the film's title is kind of the metaphor of, of pushing things beyond their boundary until you essentially crash and burn. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, talk a bit about your collaboration with Gregory because on, in the docu, it just seems like there's a point where you were kind of like hesitant or suspicious, oh, should I trust this guy? And then, you know, you become trusting of him and then you become concerned for uh, for your situation later on. Uh, talk a bit about uh, that aspect. Well, um, you know, Gregory Rachenkov um, is essentially Russia's Snowden. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a friendship of two years. We were working together. And then um, his life was in jeopardy. And I helped him get to America and then worked with him over seven months to bring his story forward to the New York Times. Um, and so it was uh, quite a... Uh, uh, concerning and, uh, and, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, tense time, um, dealing with the reality of what he was bringing forward and wanted to bring forward and trying to protect him in order to do that. So, so, um, is it fair to say that the movies has some sort of political undertones with whistleblower, with, with Russia government, now that Russia's back on the news again, <laughs> anything like that? The, uh, was that intentional? Well, the story for me was not intentional, mm -hmm. but what the show, what the movie shows, mm -hmm. beyond a question of a doubt, is to the extent to which Russia will go mm -hmm. to cheat. And if they're willing to go to the extent that is uncovered and proven, in Icarus, then it leads to a deeper conversation of of what other things are they are they willing to tamper or meddle with, mm -hmm. and so I think in regards to our own election or anybody who might be doubting as to whether or not this is true, or doubting what the CIA and the NSA and the FBI found in their investigation, I think this film shines a light into what that government is capable of doing uh, to cheat and to involve themselves in international affairs. Right, so I'm winding down to my final questions here. Um, so as a cycling aficionado, sports aficionado, I mean, um, now that you know or having experienced this, uh, making this docu, um, so what do you see about the world of sports today? I mean, uh, do you see it in the light of like, oh man, skepticism, I guess you could say? No. No, because I don't, I'm able to watch sport for what I think sport should be, which is entertainment mm -hmm. and human accomplishment and human feat 
and athletic prowess and daring and training. And so when I see an incredible athlete, whether that's LeBron James on the basketball field or Usain Bolt running or a Lance Armstrong or Chris Froome or any one of these number of spectacular athletes around the world, I am watching for the enjoyment of the sport. So if I try to start thinking about, wait, maybe that guy took some testosterone. Oh, maybe he took one of the thousand substances on the water list. Maybe he did this. Maybe he did that. Then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm no longer an admirer and a fan. I'm an investigator. And, um, and, and to me, I think that as a society, we, we're going to have to reassess at some point this examination of clean sport of what this means in the face of technological advancement and medical advancement. So, you know, you, we can't have it both ways. We can't have, you know, science trying to figure out how we're going to live to 150 years old, which is performance enhancement, and at the same time have this spectacular, you know, list of, of, of thousands of substances that every day you add to that is banned because it's a cat and mouse game. And that cat and mouse game has been going on throughout all of sport history. It's going to continue to go on. And so, and the next phase of this is genetic engineering, which is already happening. Meaning, if I go have a baby right now and I have enough money, I can see to it that my son is six foot two. I can see to it that my son has blue eyes, that my son doesn't lose his hair, that he doesn't develop Alzheimer's, that he doesn't get prostate cancer, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is performance enhancing. So somewhere along the line, we as a society, and I don't have that answer because I'm not advocating that, that athletes take drugs. I'm not advocating that, that there shouldn't be rules and regulations. But what I am saying is that there is a scientific reality to the situation and the human evolution, uh, you know, uh, reality that we are still evolving as humans. And that means also in the world of athletics and human performance. And how do we deal with that? And I don't have that answer, but I do know that the situation is going to continue and continue and continue unless medical science just stops where it is and human, uh, and human, and human beings stop evolving where they are. Because as long as those two things are in place, there is always going to be the desire to enhance performance. And also when you have billions of dollars in money and championships and gold medal and professional contracts on the line, it is an incredibly, incredibly, you know, competitive battlefield. And only the top 0.01, percent will ever make it into professional sports. And the stakes are incredibly high. So. Uh, I, I don't know what, what it means for the future of anti-doping, but I do know that it hasn't lessened my interest in sport or my love of sport or my interest in watching sport. Now, last question. I know you're also a, a playwright. I mean, uh, what, what, what are you up to next? Are you going to go to the stage? Another film coming up? What's your next project? Well, um, I, like, I like projects that explore the truth, that um, are... Uh, our journeys. And so, you know, I'm looking at other documentaries of interest, of, of subject matter that I'm interested in exploring. I'm looking at uh, some narrative features that are political and, and based on, on truth. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I haven't decided yet. I'm in the middle of this whirlwind with this film. And um, I think in a couple months from now, I'll be able to kind of gather myself and start thinking about what my next thing is. But, uh, you know, but I love documentary film um, as it just allows you to just pick up a camera and go and essentially follow uh, a journey. And I love narrative uh, filmmaking and television and playwriting as well in the sense that you can craft something uh, from your imagination and know essentially where that journey is going to go before you start. So. I enjoy uh, all mediums. I guess we'll see. All right. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations. Yeah.